What's up, everybody? My name is Dimitri Kofinas, and you're listening to Hidden Forces, a podcast that inspires investors, entrepreneurs, and everyday citizens to challenge consensus narratives and to learn how to think critically about the systems of power shaping our world. My guest in this week's episode is Rory Kethlin Jones. Rory is the BBC's principal technology correspondent, which means that he's responsible for reporting on the biggest developments and news stories in tech. From the dot-com bubble of the late 1990s to the rise of Google and Facebook, he's covered it all and interviewed some of the most influential tech luminaries and entrepreneurs from Steve Jobs to Mark Zuckerberg to Elon Musk. Stories from these interviews and more are part of his new book titled Always On that chronicles the rise of the smartphone era and how technology has altered our customs, our expectations, and our very lives in ways that are easy to forget only 15 years since the launch of the first iPhone. This is a conversation unlike most any other that you will have heard on this podcast, because there isn't one particular lesson that I want you to take away from it. Instead, I want you to use it as an opportunity to reflect on just how much change we've seen in our lives over the last 15 years, and think about not only the causes of that change, but how different the world will be over the next 15 if current trends continue and what that's going to mean for our lives, for our businesses, and for our political systems. In the overtime, Rory shares his impressions of Silicon Valley culture and what he's learned from interviewing some of the most powerful people in tech. We also discuss the transformation of media, cultural differences between British and American journalists and the press, and the future of independent publishing and podcasting, and what it means for the viability of traditional news outlets, especially those that depend on ever more sensationalism and controversy in order to eke out a profit in this hyper-competitive media landscape. So without any further ado, please enjoy yet another educational, entertaining, and engaging episode with my guest, Rory Kethlin Jones. Rory Kethlin Jones, welcome to Hidden Forces. Very excited to be here. It's my pleasure having you on the podcast, Rory. I loved reading your book. I really enjoyed it. And it was so different than what I'm used to doing, which is usually the kind of stuff that we have whenever we do technology-related episodes. They're very technical and they're focused on some particular aspects of technology or maybe the effect of technology on society, which I do think is something that's relevant to your work and to your experience in your career, which I think you can help shed some light on. But I think what's also really fascinating about it, having you on is that you're, you're a big name in media and in journalism. And the BBC is, there's no comparable media outfit in the United States. I mean, PBS is a public broadcasting system in the way that the BBC is, but it doesn't have the same type of cultural significance or reach in the public. So it'll be fascinating to also get your perspective as someone who's worked in the media since the early 1980s, I believe, or late, late 70s. That's true. 1981, I started. I mean, amazing. And your father was a director at the BBC. I believe your mother also worked at the BBC. And you have a podcast, you have a Substack account. So you've seen so much, you've seen so much transformation and you've embraced it, which also makes you really wonderful and unique. So instead of me droning on and on about your background, because especially we have so many, we do have many listeners in the UK who don't need to know who you are. They know who you are already. But for those of our listeners who are piping in from anywhere else in the world, in particular the US, where a lot of people don't know anything outside of American borders. Tell us a little bit about who you are, what you do at the BBC, and how you got into journalism. Well, I am a BBC lifer, and you're right. The BBC is an extraordinary organization, which is about next year to celebrate its centenary and dominates the media landscape in Britain in, in a way which you know Americans might find difficult to come to terms with. It's supported by a license fee, which everyone has to pay, which is would be extremely controversial, I know, in the United States. is sometimes controversial in the UK, but somehow has survived my 40 years at the BBC. I joined the BBC in 1981 in a local newsroom working on local news. I spent some time in the national newsroom as a producer, always wanted to be on air. So went to a local station, BBC Wales, doing their evening news and then came back, worked on The Breakfast Show, became a business correspondent. And then in the late 90s, 
I was kind of bored with the standard business stories I was covering, but I was very excited by what I saw happening in terms of technology. The dot-com era, if you think about the late 90s, what a time to be covering technology or, or wanting to cover technology. The birth of Google, the dot-com era, the dot-com bubble. And eventually, because of those were the stories I was showing so much interest in, in 2007, the BBC said to me, hey, why don't we call you technology correspondent? And that's what I've been doing ever since. And it's interesting what you said about the book and so on. The book is written by someone whose job has always been not to be highly technical, but to translate the excitement and the importance of this extraordinary era to a very broad audience, not to be too specialist. Quite a difficult tightrope to walk because you're often in danger of kind of offending real specialists. There are a lot of very knowledgeable people out there. But at the same time, you've got to reach the people who will watch the nightly news program, listen to the morning radio, even read the BBC website, who have a passing interest in technology, but no great knowledge of it. So that's been my mission, mm. conveying the excitement of this era, which has been a fascinating era. I was appointed BBC technology correspondent in January 2007. My first big story was being at the launch of the iPhone, the unveiling of the iPhone. And that's the story the book tells, how that era unfolded from that moment. Yeah, that's uh, I love that part of the book. The unveiling of the iPhone happened at the Moscone Center in, in San Francisco, as you say, in January of 2007. I only had an opportunity, like most people, to watch that from television. What was it like to actually be there? Well, let me give you the context here. So I'd been appointed technology correspondent and we had decided that the BBC would go big time for the first time to CES, the, the annual great big gadget show in Las Vegas, which I've been to lots of times since. And we were spending quite a lot of money. The BBC is very careful about its money because, you know, it's always limited. But I said to my bosses, listen, I know we're spending all this money to go to Vegas, but I think it's going to be worth taking a day out because Steve Jobs doesn't go to other people's events. He runs his own event and it's called Macworld. And the rumor is that there's going to be something big there. So I landed in San Francisco from Vegas for just a day, pitched up at the Moscone Center. And it was my first experience as a kind of slightly cynical British journalist of that atmosphere that you got at Apple events and increasingly at other events. Because I was used to going to press conferences where it's taboo for a British journalist to clap at a press conference. You would never dream of doing that. <laughs> and suddenly I was in this hall where people were whooping and hollering. <laughs> and of course, there, there were some journalists, there were a lot of bloggers. I think what one had to realize back then, and, and it's still the case, is that there was a kind of an audience of bloggers who made their money by being incredibly uncritically enthusiastic about Apple products. So they were there. But it was, what un unfolded was the most extraordinary performance by Steve Jobs, because he took to the stage in his trademark jeans and black polo neck sweater and wireframe glasses. And he didn't say anything for a couple of seconds. He just strode head down and then stopped and said, we're going to make some history here today. <laughs> and again, as a cynical British hack, I was going, oh, please, here we go. And then he outlined the history of technology and in particular, groundbreaking Apple products from the first Mac to the iMac to more recently the iPod. And then he said, he eventually built up to, we're going to unveil not one, but three groundbreaking products here today. And he kept on with his mantra, an internet device, a music player, and a phone, an internet device, a music player, and a phone. And eventually he said, are you getting it yet? Because they all were beginning to get it. It was all one device and it was the iPhone and everybody went mad. And it was a brilliant performance. I don't know if you've seen the film about Steve Jobs where what happens backstage at those keynotes, and it was, which I thought was very believable, is that the support team who'd get anything wrong get absolutely crucified, but, but <laughs> nothing really went wrong that time. It all worked. And the reason I, 
I mean, I was really impressed. The reason I knew that this was going to be big was when I got out of the hall, running back, because we were eight hours behind London, and that meant we were in a tearing hurry to get our item on the nightly news. And I took a call from the news desk saying, who had seen the, the pictures, the agency pictures coming out of this phone. And bear in mind, my news desk, full of wizened old hacks, not very impressed by technology. But this guy was saying, you've got to get your hands on that phone. It's amazing. And then there was a whole business of me saying, there's no way I'm going to get my hands on the phone. Apple doesn't do that. The phone's not actually coming out for another six months. They won't let me near it. Until I realized that I'd booked an interview with not Steve Jobs, but Phil Schiller, his marketing chief. And I'd rather sort of said to Apple, yeah, yeah, we'll definitely come, thinking, no, we won't. We won't be interested in Phil Schiller. And I changed my mind and reversed back, leaving the cameraman to go and edit and grabbing another little cameraman. And when and interviewed Phil Schiller, but first of all said to him, you don't happen to have the phone, do you? And of course he did. And I took the phone, grasped the phone from his hand <laughs> and stood there and did my, what we call a piece to camera, what American crews call a stand-upper, grasping the phone. And that was a, a big moment. And I say in the book, it was, there were complaints about the piece that went out on TV. British viewers said, you're plugging a product. You shouldn't be plugging a product. And I went on a complaints program and said, well, I think that was the kind of moment that Henry Ford launched the Model T Ford. Would we have covered that? And this was a Henry Ford moment. And I think that proved to be the case. Well, didn't some other broadcasters claim that you looked like you were holding the one true cross in your hand? Yeah, yeah. Which, of course, reflected the fact that it had been such a struggle to get hold of the thing. Well, I think it also reflects something else that I'd like to ask you about, which is if consumerism has become sort of the new religion and that these really uh, perfected by Steve Jobs, these product reveal ceremonies are a form of ceremony, religious ceremony, and then subsequently the purchasing and use of these products has become sort of ritualistic. And it's sort of as part of that larger context, do you think that people or how many people appreciated at the time how viscerally transformational this product was? Well, certainly the rest of the, I mean, the, what, it's an extraordinary, you know, business case story. You know, I'm, I'm sure p books have already been written. Harvard Business School has probably done endless studies. But certainly what happened was that the rivals didn't see it. They were very keen to downplay the significance of the iPhone. Steve Ballmer, leading Microsoft at the time, which would eventually launched Windows Phone and already had a big Windows offering, which he thought was going to be big, just poo-pooed it and said, this is never going to be, it's going to be a, of a tiny market share, which in a way was true. It's, it's never had the dominant market share, but he, he refused to see what the significance would be. Nokia, which was, of course, the giant of the industry, Finland's Nokia, much loved company, slightly, you know, mourned. It didn't see this coming. It was completely destroyed by the iPhone. I tell a story of a British executive retailer who went to see Nokia and tell his, his contacts there that this was going to be big and he might be buying iPhones rather than Nokias. And him telling his Nokia counterparts, it's the kind of phone my four-year-old child could play with. And the Nokia executives responding, we don't make phones for four-year-olds. So there was... A, a lot of blindness, a lack of a willingness to see what an important moment this was. But it was also the kind of changing of the guard. Somebody mm. described it as the era of the bellheads, the people who were from the telecoms industry, confronting the netheads, the Googles, the Apples, the software people, because, of course, you know, it was the software that ended up being key in many ways, despite the beauty of the device. And the NetHeads obviously won. Hmm. Well, one of the, the things that I was thinking about when I was reading the book and you were describing this is that we really haven't had a, a Jobsian-like figure. I mean, Elon Musk has tried to fill his shoes, but I really don't think we've had anyone like him. What was it about Steve Jobs and the iPhone that people found so compelling? And what was it about Apple that people loved so much? 
I mean, Apple was the kind of indie band that went mainstream, wasn't it? Because for mm. years, there was a sort of cachet in having an Apple device, an Apple computer. You knew it was more expensive and it was a failing company, but you were you were the fan of this indie band. And Microsoft was the hated dominant organization. And, you know, you, I don't know if you remember, but people used to write the word Microsoft with a dollar replacing the S as if Microsoft is only about money. And obviously Apple wasn't about money because it was not making any. And then the roles were reversed. I mean, what was compelling about Steve Jobs, that from my point of view, was that he was a communicator in a way that an awful lot of tech chief executives were not. He could speak without the jargon. He Well, he created his own, you know, special Apple speak. He was a performer. He presented a compelling vision and he put on a show. I mean, these keynotes were great shows. I do think, you know, 14 years later, that kind of magic has faded and would have faded even if he, he'd still been alive because there's a sort of law of diminishing marginal returns. You can change the world once, but, you know, when you come up with the 12th version of a, a slab, a rectangular slab of black glass, it is it is a lot more difficult to get people excited. But what, what Apple did was give people, A, a sense of excitement about the magic of the technology and the beauty of it. I mean, it, it wasn't technically as good as quite a lot of existing phones. Don't forget the first iPhone didn't even have 3G. It had a lot missing from it, but it was captivating in a way mm. that others were not. Well, I also remember how many people were pessimistic on the phone. One of the common complaints was that it didn't have a touchpad. It didn't have a keypad. BlackBerry users would never use it. And I do think there is something true to the fact that, like you said, there was a changing of the guard. There was also a generational component to this, which is this was embraced by younger people and non-professionals in a way that, you know, let's say finance people who had their BlackBerry did not. Yeah, but it, uh, it was also, it wasn't just younger people. It was democratizing the phone. I mean, the real aficionados of phones before then had been, you know, to use a cliche, geeks, the people who really wanted to understand how the technology work worked, were wedded to a certain way of doing things. And Apple reached out way beyond that. I mean, just by making things easy. Apple launches products often years after others have tried them out. Think of the iPad. I remember when the iPad came mm. out, looking back at a picture of Bill Gates in 2001 with a Windows tablet PC which was a very ugly piece of kit. Uh, it just did not communicate to people. Apple had the ability to democratize technology in a way that some didn't. Yeah. How do you think, do you ever think about how Apple and the iPhone would be different products and different companies if Steve Jobs were still around? I mean, one of the things I noticed, and again, you're probably the perfect person to ask this to, I noticed that the phone became increasingly more complicated. One of the things that Jobs really preached was simplicity, that people wanted not just simple products, but they also wanted direction. They wanted to be educated on how to use it, and they didn't want to have too many options. And the phone has actually moved more towards the Android side and away from what iPhone, what sort of used to be so unique about the iPhone, which was its simplicity. Does that resonate with you at all? And has Apple also become much more of a sort of just uh, almost like a Sony in terms of its consumer products. Yeah, I know what you mean. There is not the excitement that there was under Steve Jobs, but I will, I, I'll, I'll tell you two points here. First of all, it's difficult to say that under Tim Cook, Apple has not done well with the iPhone. You know, from 2011 to now, the iPhone has just gone on to, to reinforce its position as the single most profitable product in history. Hmm. And it keeps, every time it seems to be on the wane, it comes charging back. And the other thing I would say is there's no guarantee that Steve Jobs would have gone on to produce, you know, more iPhone moments. And he got some things wrong. He, not only was, so 2007 was a, a great key moment, perhaps more important in the success of the iPhone 
uh, and the way it transformed the world was 2008 and the launch of the App Store. And that was something that Steve Jobs had to be persuaded into because of his extraordinary controlling nature. He had not wanted any old, old app to end mm -hmm. up on his beloved iPhone. You got what Apple produced, you know, with its particular design skills. And then people started sideloading apps onto it. And eventually Apple said, right, we're, they still were obviously exerting a lot of control, but they opened the app store and it was the app economy, the, the, the ecosystem that really cemented Apple's hmm. victory. So Steve Jobs didn't always get everything right. And, you know, there's no guarantee that I'm sure, in fact, he would probably have got bored with the iPhone. He, he would have been, I've done that. I will let other people carry on changing that, but I will move on to something else. Right, which actually what I was thinking was that, and this kind of reminded me of a case study from a book called Moonshots written by Safi Bacall, who had been on the program, the case of uh, Pan Am and American Airlines. And Pan Am was founded by a sort of Jobsian type figure, similar to, to Polaroid, an innovator who was product driven. Whereas American Airlines was at the time led by a incremental innovation business model type guy, mm. uh, similar to, to Tim Cook. A and, logistics kind of guy. Right, exactly. And, and uh, if I remember correctly, American Airlines was able to really take advantage of the deregulation of the airline industry with some of these really important incremental innovations. Whereas what happened was Pan Am over-innovated, so to speak. Pan Am went long the jumbo jet and it ultimately cost the company, It's I think it went bankrupt in 1991, it was bought out, I don't remember how it resolved. And that could have been ultimately where things would have gone for Steve, whereas he might have created another incredible product like a, like an Apple back in the 1980s or uh, or Next, and just you know be priced out of the market. He could, have, or, he, he could, have, he could have created another Newton. Another you know, Newton, exactly, way yeah. ahead of its time, you know, speaking yeah. of, of being ahead of their time. So I want to bring it back again to what I think um, interests me most about this opportunity to speak with you, which is your experience in media and also generally speaking in technology and covering this, because you've covered at the very least two technological revolutions. One is with the iPhone and mobile, actually arguably three, internet and also the personal computer. That's one. And then the other one is the parallel track of media. Now, there's also the difference between the British version of the British ecosystem or and even the larger European media ecosystem and how that is culturally distinct from the American one. So there's that. But then there's also just the fact that technology has transformed this entire space. And you are, I think, rare in that you have embraced that. You have a podcast, which is very successful. You have a sub stack. You're a prolific Twitterer. Uh, so... Maybe we can talk about that first. How has the I, I media changed? I haven't yet managed TikTok. That's I my have neither. shame. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think of TikTok? What is that? How much have you engaged with that platform? I've kind of watched and admired, really. I mean, it, it kind of sums up the good and the bad of this extraordinary media age. I mean, you were talking about the revolutions I've, I've covered. The two revolutions I particularly focus on in this book are, one, the smartphone, and two, these extraordinarily powerful social media networks and how those two came together to you know transform the way we live and tiktok the great of it is is that it, it is the explosion of creativity that you know tim berners lee for example had always wanted from the web mm -hmm. which didn't happen in the early days of the web i mean when he created the web tim berners lee talked about it as a read write space you know, so different from broadcasting. I started in broadcasting. I grew up in the TV age where we all sat mesmerized in front of this magic box. And it was a very one-way experience. Tim Berners-Lee wanted the web to be a two-way experience, a read-write experience. Yet until it went mobile and until in many ways the social media giants came along, for most people, it was still mostly a broadcast experience. TikTok is the ultimate, you know, creative experience. But with all that, and we don't see it as much reported with TikTok as with other social media platforms, comes all the damaging impacts of social media and the unregulated kind of nightmare world of trolling and abuse. 
Well, also, there's something else that's interesting about TikTok, which is that what we've seen with media, with hyper-connected, ubiquitous connectivity through mobile and, and broadband and social media, has been the condensing of time. Everything becomes shorter and shorter as people's attention spans narrow and narrow. How real is that? I mean, how have you experienced that as a broadcaster and as a creator of content in your career? Well, I think that's an interesting theory, and I think I might begin to challenge it. So in my career as a broadcaster, certainly that is tr- – well, here's one example. When I began in broadcasting, the average sound of a uh, duration of a sound bite was maybe 30 to 40 seconds, mm-hmm. and it's come down and down and down and down and down over the years to – well, we look at American TV news sometimes and go, God, where somebody goes, yes, and somebody else goes, no, and that's a soundbite. Mm-hmm. But just look at what's happening on YouTube now on platforms like Vice. There is evidence that there is an appetite quite often for long form, mm-hmm. for just immersing yourself in video at greater and greater length. Yes, there, there is a, you know, there's a short attention span for some stuff, people dip in and out, but there is the possibility of, you know, long and absorbing online experiences. And that's happened as well in the sort of, you think about the documentary world, in fact, too much, too much, quite often, you know, the ninth series of this documentary that might well have been compressed into a 90 minute experience. So I think it's fragmented. There, there are all sorts of incredibly fleeting short-term ephemeral experiences, and there are a lot of immersive long ones. I couldn't agree more with that, actually. And that, of course, is the reason why I, one of the, one of the reasons why I created this podcast and, and I created it the way that I did, that it's a long form, two hour long conversation. So that actually speaks to podcasting because you, you work in podcasting. It's a fascinating medium. Actually, in general, I, I'm just someone who's endlessly fascinated by the role that media plays in shaping culture, in taking cues from culture, but then also telling us about who we are. And each, obviously, each technology comes with its own set of business models, uh, its own distribution, and its own particulars in terms of how it shapes the content. What are your thoughts on podcasting, on this phenomenon of podcasting? It's not as popular in the UK as it is in the US. It's pretty popular. It's It's become more popular. uh, Well, I mean, here's the situation. It's very dominated in the UK by the BBC, which, you know, some people might possibly rightly say was distorting the market because so many BBC programs are put out, frankly, as podcasts, mine included. There are some that are now specially crafted just for podcast, but there are a lot of programs that are just put out there for people who've always liked and now basically get on demand. My feeling about the podcast boom is I hope it continues, but I have slight concerns that it may be built on sand, that it may we may be going through a bubble. I think the economics of it are really interesting. I don't see an awful lot of evidence that many podcasts are sustainable. I think many of them are supported by kind of vanity corporate money. It's the latest thing. Companies used to buy full page adverts in the Financial Times or the Wall Street Journal, which were kind of, you know, the return on the investment was always very hazy. Mm -hmm. They were brand building. And I think the great thing from podcasting right now is that it's getting some of that money. You know, you're getting support for podcasts, podcasts made feasible by that kind of money. Whether there is enough actual consumer demand to support a continued expansion that we've seen of podcasting, Mm. I'm not so sure. That's interesting. I mean, like, I would actually agree that there's going to be a huge culling of the field, certainly during a recession, because so much is dependent on sponsorships. But you're saying is that the entire industry would be wiped out eventually because it's- No, no. What I'm saying is, well, I mean, there are so many different business models, aren't there? I've done quite a few podcasts lately been a guest on quite a few podcasts. Some, you know, I, I was spoke on one British media podcast the other day from a, a guy who runs a great gadget blog. And I said, what's the point of the podcast? He had no sponsors, no advertising. And he said, oh, it's just part of our brand. 
Mm. You know, that's one model. Uh, I was on another cybersecurity podcast, which was much longer, less edited, quite fun, it's like rambly. It had a sponsor. And I would bet that that sponsor probably has no idea how many people actually listen to it and probably doesn't care that much. And that kind of support mechanism may be ephemeral. You know, when a new platform emerges, that money may move to that or may go back to just straightforward social media advertising or or disappear altogether. Yeah, no, I mean, that's a really interesting take. I mean, I will tell you for this podcast, I turned down sponsorship money early on because I, for a number of reasons, I wanted to try and build a subscription model. And this podcast is supported with 2,000 paid subscribers currently paying between 10 and and $1,000 a month. So there's that a, is fantastic. It is, and I'm very happy about it. You know, it required extra work to do it, but it it shows you that there really is a market out there. And what's also I think encouraging about this podcast's success is that while I do depend on a large cohort of financially minded investors and tech people, the content isn't focused on just tech and finance. There's philosophy, religion, science, medicine, art. So. I found a, a way to do it. And I think, you know, so I, I, I think there are, but I, I will grant you that it, it's very difficult to monetize podcasts if you don't have a large enough audience. But the problem with, with sponsorships, again, is that it leaves you vulnerable. And another thing I should say is that what I have found to be true is that authors love to go on podcasts. You know, it's like the one place where you can really sell books. Yeah. Well, no, <laughs> I, I, I'm just that author, but I think there are interesting parallels with the publishing world here. The, anyone who's ever written a book will know that it's a lovely thing to have done, but it is not a way to make a living. Publishing is a bit like venture capital. Out of every 10 books, one will be a blockbuster, a couple will break even, and the rest will lose money. And the problem is of supply. There are endless numbers of people willing to be, wanting to be authors, whether or not they make a living out of it. Right. And I think that's the same with podcasting. There are endless number. It, it is not totally. that expensive. It's easier, frankly, to start a podcast than to get a book published. And that means there's an awful lot of supply, which is frankly sort of uneconomic supply. Well, it's also hundred percent. And that also speaks to something else, which is that, and I'm, I'm curious what your th thoughts are on this and if it resonates. I have noticed, and it's not just true in podcasting and media across the board, People have become increasingly branded or they self-brand and they see the entire scope of their existence as a commercial operation. And I think that's one way in which podcasting has, has fit into things. And that actually speaks to something else. So there's that one phenomenon of commercial branding and the branding of, of oneself. And, and, and that, again, is part of this larger commercialization and seeping of capitalism to everything, which speaks to the point about religion and ritual. Is it about capitalism though? Is it not about identity and democratization? People used to, well, I mean, on a sort of micro scale, I think about journalists who work for, used to working for big organizations. And quite often, you know, there would have been a few star journalists, but most people would have been fairly anonymous, just cogs in the machine. And now they all want to, uh, and I put my hand up, they want to have their own sub stack. They want to strike out on their own. They want their own brand. And that probably applies more broadly to all sorts of people who were just cogs in giant machines and see the internet as an opportunity to break free from that. A hundred percent. That's definitely true. So I agree with that. And, and we can explore that uh, all day, every day. I think it's it's absolutely true. What I mean about capitalism or commercialization is that so many otherwise intimate moments or things that previously were not monetizable have become monetizable today. Reality TV, the phenomenon of reality TV is a big part of that. You see that with influencers, people that basically use the same medium that you and I might use to share moments of our personal lives. They use those to monetize their lives mm -hmm. in a variety of ways, which again, it's I think there is a connection there, the same connection that speaks to why we fulfill so many of our ritualistic desires through commercial technologies and products. 
In terms of the personality-driven media, this is also something that fascinates me because, of course, in the United States, we have Joe Rogan. Joe Rogan is the, sort of the ultimate manifestation of the modern media age and media ecosystem. He has more viewers, more downloads, more streams than anyone else in media. No one knows exactly. Well, some people do, but most people who listen to him have no idea of just how popular he is. I don't think there's anyone like that in the UK, for example. Do you think one that, well, first, what is driving this empowerment of the individual through technology, right? We also see this, for example, in sports, not to go too far afield, but athletes today have much more power than they used to have relative to the ownership, relative to the leagues that they play in. Um, and I think media, their ability to distribute their message is part of that. But what is driving that, the, the power of the individual? How much of it is changing people's relationship to news and to information? And is this ultimately a good thing? Where do you see this going? Wow, that's a whole lot of big questions. I mean, obviously, the technology has made a huge difference. We've what I was talking about earlier. We've gone from the very simple broadcast model with and a very hierarchical model where a few major media organisations controlled the flow of information, and to a we say it's more democratised, but then it's also a winner takes all situation, both in sports and in wider celebrity culture, that one person can reach a massive audience very quickly without much intermediation. And people have got the ability to connect with those personalities in a way they never had before and are finding that attractive. I think it'll be interesting to see how long those those personalities last. Will Joe Rogan be as big a thing in five, 10 years time as he was. You know, celebrities historically have had very long careers. They've, you know, they've gone on until they die. I think they may be more ephemeral these days, but it speaks to a desire to connect, to admire, to feel kind of ownership of a celebrity that maybe didn't exist to that, that extent before. How much of that is authenticity, that people crave authenticity in a world that feels increasingly phony? Yeah, well, that, what's the old phrase? If you can fake authenticity, you can, you've can you really got it made. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, well, there's a culture now, and I'm going to actually move this part of the conversation to the overtime, Rory, because you, you mentioned early on, you talked about this sort of cynical British approach to media when you were at the Moscone Center in 2007. Something that I've always noticed, I've never actually understood why there is that distinction. You know, if you go, let's say, on on Hard Talk at the BBC and versus if you're on, I don't know, some equivalent program in the United States, why there is that sort of cynical culture in, in British journalism. However, I found that that cynicism actually quite refreshing in your book because- Yeah, I've, I've got a couple of stories to tell about that. Well, exactly. So I, I well, well, and we'll, we'll do that. I'll move us into the overtime for that. But the reason I found it refreshing, just to tease it to listeners, is because I, and I, and I know many other people have become sort of, have reached our limit with this fake it till you make it, sanctimonious culture in tech. And it was really refreshing for me to have you interview some of the biggest names in the industry, like Elon Musk or Mark Zuckerberg, and to actually have you give a much more raw, honest impression of their messaging, their products, their pitches, et cetera. And I want to ask you about what your experience of the, some of those people was like, but I'm going to hold those questions off for the second half of our conversation, Rory. For anyone who is new to the program, Hidden Forces is listener supported. We don't accept advertisers or commercial sponsors. The entire show is funded from top to bottom by listeners like you. If you want access to the second part of today's conversation with Rory, as well as the transcripts and rundowns to this episode and every other episode we've ever done, head over to hiddenforces.io and check out our episode library or subscribe directly through our Patreon page at patreon.com slash hiddenforces. There's also a link in the summary page to this episode with instructions on how to connect the overtime feed to your phone so that you can listen to these extra discussions just like you listen to the regular podcast. Rory, stick around. We're going to move the second half of our conversation into the subscriber overtime. For more information about this week's episode of Hidden Forces, or if you want easy access to related programming, 
visit our website at hiddenforces.io and subscribe to our free email list. If you want access to overtime segments, episode transcripts, and show rundowns full of links and detailed information related to each and every episode, check out our premium subscription available through the Hidden Forces website or through our Patreon page at patreon.com slash hidden forces. Today's episode was produced by me and edited by Stylianos Nicolaou. For more episodes, you can check out our website at hiddenforces.io. Join the conversation at Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Hidden Forces Pod, or send me an email at dk at hiddenforces.io. As always, thanks for listening. We'll see you next week.